everybody could find their seats, we're ready to go. Yes, and if you could turn off your phones, that would be appreciated as well. Although if you have a nice melody, maybe you want to, no, it's okay. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone, and we have a nice crowd here. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone, and those of you who are watching online as well, uh, to our uh, seminar, Climate Change, How Long Island Can Prepare For It. Uh, my name is Elliot Shulman, for those of you who don't know who I am, and I'm a member of the Executive Committee at uh, Temple Aboda, and we're delighted to have this seminar. It's, uh, it's a great thing. We, uh, it's a good thing to share with the community, and we're very happy that we have a distinguished panel here tonight that can tell you all about and talk to you about climate change on Long Island. Um, before I uh, introduce you to our distinguished panel, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors as well as the people on the Social Action Committee who were instrumental in bringing this all together. Uh, our, our sponsors include Simon Paston and Sons, providers of insurance services to Long Island for their office in, from their office in Lindbrook. Olympus Abstract LLC, providers of title services to Long Islanders from their Belmore office. Sun Nation, providing consultation, sales, and service of solar systems to Long Island since 2003, and M&T Bank, understanding what's important. Uh, now getting on to the seminar, I'd like to introduce somebody else who you probably all know, uh, Carol Katz. The, uh, this seminar, seminar is actually her baby. Wouldn't have happened without her. Uh, she also ha she's been working on this for a couple of years. It was sidetracked by the pandemic. Yes, Carol, oh, yeah. There you are. And she was assisted by Dan Hennick and Jeff Elias, uh, also members of the Social Action Committee. And they all work closely together. Thank you for your hard work. We already gave you the applause, so no more applause. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, <laughs> Carol, would you like to say a few words? Yes, very few. Thank you everyone for coming. Those who are here in person, those who are, ah, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. And those who are watching online, um, I have a very vivid image in my head of watching water rise higher and higher in my home until it reached four feet. That was back in 2012 with the unforgettable visit of Superstorm Sandy and I know that several of you experienced the very same thing. I have been concerned with climate change ever since and finally in 2019 as a member of the Social Action Committee I proposed holding a seminar of this nature. They were enthusiastic about it. I went ahead, I put together a panel of legislators because I thought they would be the ones who could speak effectively about it. Um, and then of course, uh, it, was, it was to be presented in June of 2020 and along came the pandemic and all public gatherings were canceled, of course. Fast forward to tonight. Instead of legislators, we will not hear any politicians speak about it. Instead, we have a wonderful panel of people who are, have a, an a, involvement day and night with climate change. This is their, their biggest concern. They are devoting all their energy to helping us learn how to become part of the solution instead of part of the problem. So I thank them all for giving their time and their expertise. They're all volunteers. They're not paid to be here. I thank Neil Lewis, who is the executive director. Neil Lewis Esquire, attorney. Um, he is the executive director of the Sustainability Institute at Malloy College. No, sorry, Malloy University, as of June 1st. Yes, yes, we have another university here on Long Island. 
And um, Neil has been wonderful in helping me put this together as well. Of course, I could not have done it without the help of Jeff Elias and Dan Hennick. I thank my sponsors, as Elliot already did, and in the interest of full disclosure, my son is the vice president of the commercial lines of Simon Paston and Sons. Richard, just stand up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. And now, without further ado, I turn this program over to Neil Lewis. Well, thank you, Sarah. Good stuff. Just nice to well, hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. I, th I think I'll lose the tie in a couple of minutes, but at this point, we're doing okay. <laughs> thank you, Adrian. Um, well, this, uh, this is uh, planned to be an uh, interesting discussion and turn it into a dialogue, a little back and forth. So I'll keep my opening comments uh, short so we can get to the panel. We do have a great panel that uh, Carol pulled together for this and um, uh, really want to uh, take a dive in. I think we all kind of confront this question of, you know, reading the newspaper, following the news, whatever way we get information, uh, as we take that information in, you know, there is this question, both what's going on with our planet in terms of climate change, um, but also, what does it mean for us in terms of action? What should we be doing differently than we're doing today? And um, the way we designed the panel is such that we can move from a discussion of sort of what is the problem, uh, you know, how really do we uh, get our minds wrapped around this notion of the entire planet uh, increasing in temperature at a rate that is really uh, very much of a concern. Um, to what it all means for what we can do about it. So we can move from, we understand the problem, to what are the big policy ideas? And uh, what are the big initiatives? And we have a great speaker for each of those points. And then we're gonna move on to a discussion of what we do as individuals. So policies and laws and changing our energy programs and uh, really switching to renewables and such. That's all great, but then what about you as an individual? Because maybe, maybe all those efforts, as important as they are, may still not be enough. This is such a big challenge. Um, so we're gonna get into that, uh, what we uh, can do as individuals. Um, and then we're also going to talk even more particularly what we can do as it relates to transportation, um, since there's so much interest in the issue of uh, gasoline prices and, and such, right? Is everybody uh, struggling with that issue? Um, so that's sort of how uh, it's we're designed uh, the program for today and uh, really looking forward to it. Um, the, uh, let me, uh, like I said, I'm going to sort of charge ahead. I do have one thing I want to throw in as sort of a, you know, people always say, let me throw in my ad. So um, as Carol said, I'm the executive director of the Sustainability Institute at Malloy College. And one of the things that we found is sort of a niche for ourselves is we put out papers, we call white papers, on uh, codes. And so we've pushed the idea that when you build new structures on Long Island, they should be as highly energy efficient as they could be. Um, that's not the case today, unfortunately. Um, we've had more success with our papers as it relates to residential. So new home construction is much more energy efficient now than it was 10 years ago. Um, actually, it was 15 years ago when we first got the change uh, in some of the towns. We got 11 out of 13 towns to change their codes. Um, so what we proposed in our most recent uh, white paper is to say, what about uh, commercial buildings that are newly constructed and they still don't put solar on the roof or really do much when it comes to um, energy efficiency and uh, use of things like batteries or better management systems and whatnot. And we sort of did an analysis uh, in our paper of several uh, places that have adopted restrictions saying, listen, if you're gonna build a new building, there should be some solar on the roof. And our recommendation in the uh, white paper we wrote is calling for all commercial buildings going forward to be required to have at least a minimum amount of solar um, included in that new uh, project. And if it can't fit on the roof, you could put it in carports out in the parking lot and other ways to get there. But the basic notion is that you're adding a new building that's gonna create more energy demand. You should also at least do something to help offset that with renewables. So that's my little pitch to one of the papers that we put uh, some effort to. Um, we have a very specific local law we're calling for, and we're trying to get towns on Long Island to adopt it. So I'm thrilled that there's gonna be a YouTube saving of this, and if anybody uh, is out there that's an elected official and wants to talk to us, please reach out to us at the Sustainability Institute, and I'd love to follow up with them. So that's my uh, little pitch on that. 
what I want to do is introduce our first speaker, and then I'll just say a word or two about what we are hoping that he'll um, cover, and uh, charge ahead. So um, first, let me, let me uh, read our professor's uh, uh, background. It's Dr. J. Brett Bennington. He is a professor of geology, but he's also the chair of the Department of Geology, Environment, and Sustainability at Hofstra University, where he has taught for just short of 30 years. His research and teaching interests include paleontology, geology, ecology, the natural history of Long Island, Charles Darwin and the history of geology, except that last part. All the other stuff seems right on target to what we're covering tonight. The other part I'm still interested in, but it's all good. Um, in uh, 2019, uh, the professor was presented with the Neil Miner Award for exceptional contributions to stimulate interest in earth sciences by the National Association of Geoscience Teachers. So he's really a recognized uh, leader on these topics. So our goal tonight with uh, the professor to kind of kick us off, is you heard geology a couple of times there. So I know a lot of people are curious about um, oil prices and how, you know, if, if you follow Facebook, it's really clear that uh, Joe Biden raised our oil prices and that somebody should do something about that. Um, so maybe the professor can explain to us how that's done and how, how one president is able to change world oil prices. Um, but um, I think he wants to start with just sort of a little bit about what is global warming. I know everybody here knows what global, but he's gonna give us a little bit of that grounding and just how serious it is and what does it really mean for Long Island, because let's face it, a lot of people are sort of uh, locally focused. And so um, what does it mean for uh, our society, our planet, but also here in our home? So with that said, let's turn it over to Professor Bennington. Thank you. All right, thank you very much and thank you for having me. Um, so uh, in 10 minutes, I'm gonna cover about <laughs> four or five weeks worth of, uh, of lecture material, so, so buckle up here. Um, I think a, a good place to start is to think a little bit about how the Earth works as a planet. If you get up uh, tomorrow morning at about 4.30 a.m. and look to the east, you will see Venus and Mars, right? A star and then a reddish star. So those are our sort of two sister planets, right? Um, and the Earth is, is kind of the Goldilocks planet. You know, we, you know, we have this climate which is just right for, for life. Venus is hellishly hot. It's about 864 degrees Fahrenheit on average on the surface of Venus. That's hot enough to melt lead. Mars, as, as David Bowie says, um, you know, or no, no, it's Elton John said, uh, you know, it's not the kind of place to raise your kids. It's uh, freezing cold. It's essentially a polar desert. Um, and, and most people think the Earth has this nice climate because it's the right distance from the sun. But actually, uh, Venus is only, you know, sort of half again as close to the sun as the Earth is. Venus gets about twice as much sunlight as the Earth does per square meter. Mars gets about half as much sunlight. So the amount of, of energy that reaches these planets doesn't explain the extreme differences in their climates, right? So we, 864 degrees Fahrenheit on Venus, 57 degrees Fahrenheit on Earth, minus 67 degrees Fahrenheit average temperature on the surface of Mars. What really controls a planet's climate is its atmosphere. Because solar radiation um, that's coming from the sun, the energy that's coming from the sun, uh, passes through um, the gases in planetary atmospheres. Hits the surface of the planet, warms the surface of the planet, that, that, that radiation is converted from visible light wavelengths to infrared wavelengths to heat, and then the heat tries to get back into space. And it would almost completely escape back into space if not for the fact that certain gases in our atmosphere trap heat, uh, greenhouse gases. So the composition of your atmosphere determines the climate that you, you have as a planet for the, you know, for the most part. Um, now, Venus has way too much carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, and that's why it's so hot. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, 100% carbon dioxide, but it's lost most of its atmosphere, and that's the main reason why Mars is so cold. The Earth has just kind of the right amount of carbon dioxide, and it's, it's a relatively small amount of carbon dioxide. But the important thing to realize is that 
um, carbon dioxide is the main greenhouse gas controlling climate in the Earth's atmosphere. And there are a number of reasons for that, which we, we don't get, need to get into. Um, methane is also a very powerful greenhouse gas, but methane breaks down fairly quickly in the Earth's atmosphere at carbon dioxide. Water is a very potent greenhouse gas, but there's a limit how much water you can put in the atmosphere because it just comes out again, it rains. Um, but carbon dioxide, you can put a lot of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere, you can take out a lot of carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so that's really you know, what, what determines the Earth's climate and carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere have been controlling the Earth's climate for mil um, billions of years actually. Um, now, the thing about carbon dioxide is there's lots of ways that it can get in and out of the atmosphere. Um, some of these pathways take a long time to work, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of years, so they're not very relevant to human beings, right? We, we, we need to worry about things that are going to happen, you know, in a sh relatively short time span, um, years to decades to hundreds of years. Um, so for humans, the, the way that carbon gets in and out of the atmosphere um, that's most important involves the biosphere. So carbon dioxide is removed from the Earth's atmosphere by plants and algae and bacteria. Any organism that photosynthesizes is essentially taking carbon dioxide from the Earth's atmosphere, taking sunlight, <coughs> using the energy from the sunlight to break down water molecules and take that carbon dioxide and turn it into organic molecules, to turn it into sugar, essentially. And then that, that is what's used to build, to build the, the tissue in the plants. Um, animals eat the plants and we take in those organic molecules. And what all organisms, both plants and animals do, is they take oxygen and use oxygen to break down the organic molecules, get energy back out, and then exhale carbon dioxide. We do this, plants do it. A any, any I, you know, any eukaryotic organism, any, any complex cell, is using oxygen to derive chemical energy from organic molecules and then releasing the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And the biosphere has been doing this for a long time. So, you know, since photosynthesis has existed for billions of years. So, again, photosynthesis is taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, building organic molecules, the byproduct of that is oxygen. The oxygen goes into the atmosphere. Respiration is a process of taking the oxygen out of the atmosphere, reacting it with organic molecules, getting the energy and putting the carbon dioxide back. All things considered, it would be a wash, right? As much carbon dioxide that came out of the atmosphere would go back into the atmosphere as everything on Earth lived and died. What makes it not completely even out is the fact that, that some organic material when it dies, doesn't oxidize, doesn't get eaten, doesn't decay, it gets buried in the earth. And if you take organic carbon and bury it in the earth, it doesn't reunite with the oxygen that was produced when it, when it was made through photosynthesis. And that's why the earth's atmosphere has oxygen in it, because for billions of years, photosynthesis has been making organic carbon and releasing oxygen, and some of that carbon is being stored away in the crust of the Earth. Now, starting about 300 million years ago, um, forests began evolving and growing, and tremendous amounts of, of carbon, of organic carbon, were being formed by photosynthesis and then buried in the Earth in the form of coal. And that has let oxygen levels rise. Um, also, organic carbon is being buried at the bottom of the ocean, and that carbon eventually ends up being buried in the crust of the earth and turned into oil, petroleum. And then over time, both coal and petroleum can break down deep in the earth and produce natural gas. So the earth has been making fossil fuel by storing away organic carbon for, let's, let's say, it's been going on for billions of years, but, but the deposits of coal, oil, and natural gas that we access um, go back to about 400 million years. Right? And what is fossil fuel? It's essentially fossil solar energy. 
right? It's, it's energy from the sun captured by photosynthesis in the form of you know, chemical bonds in organic molecules. Now, during the in, at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, humans who had been burning wood for, for energy for probably a couple million years um, tapped into these buried deposits of organic carbon uh, and discovered that, hey, you know, we can dig this stuff up, we can burn it, it releases tremendous amounts of energy, it's very portable, um, and, and we built an entire civilization on the, the cheap portable energy derived from fossil fuels. W you know, the, the world we exist in today is a world that was built on fossil fuel energy. Right? So we're kind of addicted to it. I mean, it, it, it underpins everything we do. Um, but, of course, around 100 years ago or so, uh, some physicists um, and, and atmospheric chemists pointed out that there's a, a cost to burning fossil fuel, and that cost is that, that the carbon that photosynthesis has been removing from the Earth's atmosphere for 400 million years and storing in the crust of the Earth, um, when we burn those fossil fuels, we put that carbon back in the atmosphere. Right? And if you think about it, um, over the last 200 years, we have been releasing into the Earth's atmosphere carbon that it took 400 million years to get out of the atmosphere. So we are adding carbon to the atmosphere at a rate that is unprecedented in the history of the Earth. All right? we Humans are doing something to the planet that has never happened before. The Earth has, has experienced ri you know, much higher levels of carbon dioxide in its atmosphere in the past. The Earth has been much warmer in the past than it is now and that it's likely to get in the next thousand years. But that, those, those episodes of global warming unfolded over tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. We are, um, we are in the process of causing a similar amount of global warming in hundreds of years. So it's an unprecedented rate. Um, and the reason is the burning of fossil fuels. If we want to, if we want to stop um, global warming, if we want to get it under control, uh, we need to sh shift away from burning fossil fuels. I mean, that's that's basically the, all there is to it. Um, just to, to kind of give you um, a couple numbers, uh, and uh, and then I'll and then I'll wrap it up. Um, we can actually measure how much carbon dioxide. It, is in, has been in the Earth's atmosphere in the past, going back about 800,000 years, because um, we can drill down through the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland and pull up ice cores, and in the layers of ice are little bubbles of air that were trapped as the snow compacted to form the ice. So we, we know the composition of the Earth's atmosphere going back roughly 800,000 years. And we know that during the you know, the Earth has been going through a series of ice ages with warm periods in between. And during the last four warm periods between ice ages, the maximum amount of carbon dioxide that's been in the Earth's atmosphere, the carbon dioxide levels that are associated with these warm times in between ice ages, is about 300 parts per million. Right? The last time the last interglacial, when the Earth had 300 parts per million carbon dioxide in its atmosphere, there were hippopotamuses living in London. That's how warm it was. Seriously. They found fossil hippopotamuses in the mud in the Thames River. Right? How much carbon dioxide is in the Earth's atmosphere right now? 419 parts per million. Right? So we're, already, we're, we're 100 parts per million above the, the highest level of carbon dioxide associated with the last several warm periods in Earth's history when climate was considerably warmer than it is right now. So that just kind of indicates how much carbon we've released into the atmosphere. Um, the reason why we don't have hippopotamuses in London yet is because there just hasn't been much, you know, enough time. I mean, I mean we're, we're, we haven't felt the full effects because it's happening so quickly. But we are starting to feel the effects and I just want to um, just want to give you a couple of other numbers. Um, if you look at the total cost of climate-related natural disasters, so we're talking about droughts, floods, um, freezes, uh, severe storms, uh, hurricanes, wildfires, winter storms, things like that. Um, 
natural disasters associated with the, the Earth's atmosphere and, and climate. Um, from 1980 to 1999, the total insurance losses in the United States for climate-related natural disasters was uh, $433 um, uh, billion, dollars, thank you. Right? And the average cost per, per natural disaster was about $5.5 billion. So that's, that's for 20 years from 1980 to 1999. For the 18 years from 2000 to 2018, the total insurance losses adjusted for inflation, so we're comparing apples to apples here, $1.2 trillion, four times, four times the amount for the previous stretch of 20 years, and an average uh, cost per event of $7.6 billion. So climate change is, is doing damage, and it's costing us a tremendous amount of money um, to, to deal with it. And uh, one, and you wanted me to say one thing about one thing to say about fossil fuels is um, fossil fuel, as we all know, is not evenly distributed around the world. So Mother Nature, in, in stock, you know, sort of stashing away this buried treasure, um, has seen fit to to concentrate it in certain parts of the world. So people who you know countries that that have large deposits of fossil fuel. Um, hold a lot of sway and, and economic power over countries that don't have a lot of fossil fuel and over the global economy. And of course, we're seeing that play out right now. And the interesting thing about, about fossil fuel is if you produce too much of it, it drives the price down. And the people who produce it stop producing so much because you don't want to keep making more fossil fuel if it's, you know, you're getting less and less for it. On the other hand, if there's not enough fossil fuel to go around, then the demand drives the price up and people start producing more. So the, the trick about fossil fuel is there's always enough, just enough fossil fuel to keep the world sort of humming along. And if something happens to disturb that equilibrium, then you either get a boom or a bust. And we just went through a bust because of the pandemic. So all of the petroleum producers stopped producing because at one point, the price of oil in the futures market went negative. <laughs> um, so, so all the oil producers stopped, they, they cut way back on production. They fired all their geologists and laid them off and everything. And now because of the war in Ukraine, we've swung to the other extreme and now there's a shortage of oil, but um, you know, the people that produce oil are not rushing to make more because they're making money hand over fist right now, producing what they have, and what's their incentive for producing more fossil fuel if it's just gonna drive the price down? Right. Um, and, you know, with renewable energy, renewable energy is much more evenly distributed, right? I mean, you can't, you probably don't have an oil well in your front yard, but you can have solar panels on your house. <laughs> so it's a, it's a whole different sort of economic uh, Anyway, I've gone on way too long. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bennington. And uh, yes, uh, you know, the, uh, the ref your evidence and, and one of the things we put out as evidence is looking at the insurance data. So to see a four-time increase in what's being paid out for storms, clearly something dramatic is happening. And um, <laughs> so... <laughs> so thank you for for coming. Maybe else music. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, so let's go from that. And as you said, we'll, you mentioned our homeowners and what we could do around our homes. So let's let's bring this into in, in terms of renewables that uh, many homeowners do have uh, solar on their uh, roofs. And uh, so let's talk about some of these solutions, particularly the energy issues. Adrian Esposito earned her degree in geology and environmental science. I'm from a geology person. Yeah, we got a lot of geology here today. Uh, from CW Post, she's the co-founder of the Citizens Campaign for the Environment. She's worked on a range, a number of environmental campaigns for some 35 years. Uh, Adrian, um, for example, I had Adrian speak at an event we had a number of years back, and several of the items that were her priorities have become law since then. So she's not just someone that's out there making some noise. She really gets things done and uh, is quite a leader on all these issues from 
uh, issues that have to do with our drinking water, uh, sewage treatment plants, uh, remediation of toxic plumes, stewardship of land and water, and support for large-scale renewable projects. Um, I left out pesticides as one of the other topics now that we're in the summer, that's relevant. Um, but, uh, but really, those large-scale renewable projects, that's the big kind of policy action. And uh, I can recall a number of years back, I think it was about 15 or so, mm -hmm. there was a proposal for one small offshore wind project, and Adrian uh, worked very hard along with uh, a number of us. Thank and you. We, yes, you know, we went to a lot of events together, meetings like this that were not as friendly as this group. No, no, no. They <laughs> some, were brought the mouth. Yes. <laughs> of course, there's always a few, but there were, um, there were some people that were you know, very much concerned about the idea that we might have uh, offshore wind turbines off of Long Island. Now, a number of years later, this seems like something much more real, and it's something that Adrian is playing a key role in leading. So Adrian, tell us about this and maybe give us a call for action, what we can all do. I know there's some great materials you've handed out also. Yes. So I don't really know if I, if I, if you can't hear me, just let me know, then I'll use the microphone, okay? Oh, no, I'm being, oh, oh, I'm sorry, that's right, never mind. I will use the microphone. I forgot we would oh, do this. <laughs> okay, so good evening, everyone. Um, you know, there's some bad news and there's some good news, okay? So, but it's not all dark, just so you know. Climate change is real, we know that, we know the science of it, but uh, I think it's also important, what does it mean to us on Long Island? I mean, what could possibly go wrong? We're just an island sticking out into the middle of the ocean. <laughs> Why would we be so vulnerable to climate change? Well, you know, unfortunately we like to say, because it's true, but it's not our favorite thing to say, but Long Island is on the front lines of climate change. But not only for the big things we can see, but also from some of the more subtle things. But the thing, big things that we can see are also not so good. Sea level rise, since 1900, we've already seen a one foot rise in sea level. Uh, we know that we've had more rain events. Uh, in fact, you may not know this, but the Northeast has seen a 70% increase in large, we don't even call them rainfall any anymore, we call them rain events because we used to get one inch or two inch, and then two weeks later you'd get one inch or two inch. Now, literally when it rains, it pours. So you get an eight inch rainfall, a 10 inch rainfall. A couple of years ago, we got an 11, year, uh, 11 inch rainfall, 12. And our infrastructure is not so that it's able to absorb all that. And that causes a lot of localized flooding, street closes, your basements fill up, we got the sump pumps going because we're just, we can't, the ground cannot absorb all of that rain at one time. Other areas in the nation are having drought. You probably know, but California's in the middle of a six, seven year desperate drought. Their aquifer uh, levels are dropping. We, we have more rainfall than we've ever gotten. So the distribution of rain matters. We grow a lot of uh, produce and vegetables in the West and they're running out of water. So. That, you know, just one, one thing to note. Um, I know that um, the professor gave some stats too, but I want to give this one. From 2010 to 2020, New York, I'm just going to talk about New York where we live, has experienced 31 extreme weather events equating to $100 billion in damages. That's just New York, just in 10 years. That's a lot of money. Uh, anybody remember last September? How many tornadoes did we have on Long Island? Six. Wow. Six. Never happened before. Those are the kind of records we don't want to hit. We don't want to repeat. But, uh, you know, tornadoes in Levittown. We had mudslides in Port Washington. We've never had mudslides in Port Washington. Um, we have these things called rainy day flooding. I don't know if you have them in Oceanside. If you do, let me know. You do. Okay, see, beautiful sunny day, looks nice, no rain, but because we have high tide, full moon, the wind's blowing in a certain direction, all of a sudden the canals are coming up into the streets again. Happens a lot in low-lying areas, People like uh, places like Mastic, Mastic Beach, Patchog. Uh, Massapequa and other areas all now have what, it's a new phrase, sunny day flooding. The things that we can't see are also important to us. 
something called ocean acidification. What is that? I'm going to tell you. What comes up must come down, or at least one-third of it. So scientists now believe that one-third of the carbon dioxide that's emitted into the atmosphere globally is being absorbed into the ocean. But not just the ocean, our estuaries too, our bays, our harbors. Stony Brook scientists have been testing the acidity level of our embayments and our harbors and our estuaries, and guess what? It's going up. Why does that matter? Well, for a number of reasons. The higher the acidity, the less likely we are going to be to grow things like shellfish because the acidity absor uh, sorry, dissolves the, um, the shell. Scallops, clams, oysters, uh, makes it very hard for them. Also, increased acidity kills fish larvae. They don't like increased acidity. They like it nice. They have a temperature that they like. Um, it also delays the molting for things like lobsters and blue claw crabs. So it also kills, you know, little things like phytoplankton, which is at the basis of the food chain in our, uh, in our estuaries and our oceans. So ocean acidification is called the evil twin of climate change. And I just wanted to mention it because we live here by the water. And that's another thing we should be, you know, very cognizant of. And I know we are. So under the worst case scenario, NOAA, the National Ocean and Atmospheric Administration, and that name does not roll off your tongue, said in, um, in the next 100 years, or by the year 2100, next 80 years, 150 Long Island towns would be underwater in the worst case scenario. Everything south of Sunrise Highway, I'm sorry to tell you, which also includes me in my home in Patchogue, if that makes you feel any better, which it definitely shouldn't, but I don't know why I'm saying that. It should make you feel worse. Um, so, well, I watched, that's just to tell you that climate change is real, the impacts on Long Island, I could go on and on. The only other thing I want to mention about climate change is also on Long Island, it gives us another unique problem. Because we all drink from under, underground aquifers, 100% of us get our drinking water from underground. We don't get it from a mysterious tunnel from New York City. That's a myth. <laughs> don't believe it. But the more sea level rises and salt water pushes into the land, the more it intrudes into our underground drinking water supply called our aquifer, therefore polluting it, polluting coastal water, uh, drinking water wells. And that's another problem and a challenge for us. So there are lots of challenges that uh, sea level rise is going to give us in addition to the tornadoes and the storms and the flooding and the hurricanes. But what can we do? As was said, we have an oil-based economy. Everything is centered around fossil fuels. We have to transition from fossil fuels to renewables. We like to say we can no longer be fossil fools. We have to convert away from fossil fuels. Long Island right now gets over 90% of our energy from fossil fuels, okay? New York City and Long Island are really the problem in New York State. And I know Beth's gonna go over some laws uh, after me, but we really have to make the transition. In order for New York to make the transition, New York City and Long Island must make the transition. How are we going to do that? Right now we have three uh, four base load power plants. We got Northport, Barrett, which I'm sure you've all seen. You love how beautiful it is. Northport, Port Jeff, and another one in Yapeng called Caithness. Those are all fossil fuel power plants. They use oil and natural gas. Now they use mostly natural gas. But that's where mostly it comes from. We have an underground cable that comes from New Jersey. It's called the Neptune cable. It connects to the South Shore on Long Island here, that's another 660 megawatts. So we're either using power plants on Long Island or we're getting our electric from a cable that comes from, in that case, New Jersey, in two other cases from Connecticut under Long Island Sound connecting to uh, Long Island. How are we gonna do it? How are we gonna give up this addiction to fossil fuels? Well. We're going to get many answers to that, and there's going to be multiple answers. It's not one magic thing. We all wish that, 
We like easy answers, right? We like, well, we'll just take a pill and we'll get better. But this is not that. One answer is offshore wind. That is part of the solution. Why? Well, we don't have the space on Long Island to use on land wind. That's not going to work. And because the technology of offshore wind has advanced so much over the last 20 years, it really can generate a lot of power. So one thing I want you to do is I gave everyone that handout for a reason. There's uh, the one that says transitioning. Work with me now. Um, open up that one, and there's a little map in that four-page handout. It, it's the one that says, I don't even, I, we might be, I brought 40 of them. So that map, I'm going to show you what it looks like. It looks like this. Everyone see that? Has all the little things on the bottom of the South Shore there. Let's talk about that. Offshore wind is real. It is not, you know, I do a lot of community forums and people still have a lot of questions about it. I want you to know something. Offshore wind might be new to America. It is not new to everybody else. For instance, I'm just going to throw out some numbers, but just to give you some, you know, kind of perspective. In Europe, they've been using offshore wind for quite some time. Denmark is generating almost 40% of its electricity from offshore wind. Europe overall generates 25,000 megawatts of power from offshore wind. China, not, know, not known for its forward leaning environmental policies, is generating 10,000 megawatts of power from offshore wind. America, hello America. Anybody want to guess how much America is generating? Zero. Zero's close, 42 megawatts. So we got Europe at 25,000, China at 10,000, America at 42. And we only have 42 because we have one small five turbine wind farm off of Block Island where they were um, using diesel powered generators, three old clunkers. And one of them died and they were like, oh my God, we can't even afford to fix it. They stunk. They really, there was a lot of emissions. They were loud. They were noisy. They were expensive. They ran on diesel. Um, and they, it, their time of life was done. So they decided. We're going to do an offshore power, uh, offshore wind. And uh, their electricity went down. There's no noise. There's no emissions. And they're very happy. So that's the only wind farm in America, though. <laughs> so, OK. But now, fast forward to New York. Well, that's not a wind farm. That's one turbine. That's a three kilowatt. Hold on, buckaroo. Oh, California doesn't have any offshore. I said offshore. We do have land-based wind farms. Thank you, that's true. We have that magnificent specimen of one. <laughs> Three kilowatts. It's, all, it's not even enough power to fund the energy center next door, but we like it. Um, and California has some. Texas, believe it or not. Tex I'm going off script now. Texas has the most on-land wind farms of any state in America. They saw the writing on the wall. Uh, I, it, it, I thought it was shocking, seriously. Okay, but let's talk about what we're doing here in New York. So here we go. We got five offshore wind farms. I want you to look at the little thing. Follow, follow along with me now. The first one, the little one, is see the one that says South Fork Wind Farm? It's all the way out there, off of Montauk. It's 35 miles offshore. That one is the smallest one. That one is going to connect to East Hampton. That one started construction this year, and they should be done by next year. Then, you see that other one called Sunrise Wind Farm right next to South Fork? Sunrise Wind Farm is going to connect to Suffolk County. See where it says Holbrook Station? That is a 
Big Mama Wind Farm, that's a technical term, Big Mama, um, that's going to put power right into the LIPR um, you know, generation. It's over 800 megawatts, and it will power a million homes. Then move towards the west there. You'll see Empire Wind 1 and Empire Wind 2. Empire Wind 1 is going to go up the Gowanus Canal and connect to the story of Queens. And that's another big one, over 800 megawatts. And that's going to help New York City reduce its reliance on fossil fuels. And then Empire Wind 2, which you should have a special affinity for, is going to connect to the Barrett Station and actually supply your electricity uh, here in Nassau County. And that's another big one, over 800 megawatts of power. And then I just want to mention, look at the one all the way to the east called Beacon Wind. That one, this is kind of crazy, but it's going to work, is going to have an extent, we call them the extension cord. It's their cables, right? Because they have to connect to the grid. They can't just be out there in the middle of the ocean. That's going to be 50 miles offshore. And then it's going to have a cable connection that goes down the middle of Long Island Sound. And it's going to, oh no, and that one, I'm sorry, that one's going to connect to Astoria, Queens. The other one, Empire Wind 1, I said that wrong, that's going to connect to Brooklyn. So we're going to get two wind farms connecting to the New York City market, two big ones and one small one connecting to the Long Island power grid. And that's a lot of power. So the Empire Wind 1 is big enough, and that's the one that's going to Brooklyn, 500,000 homes. Empire Wind 2, which is the one that's going here to Nassau County, uh, 600,000 homes. The uh, Sunrise Wind, that's going, I, I misspoke, I said a million, I should have said a half a million, uh, into Suffolk County homes. So these are large scale projects, they are big, it's a lot, but this will allow us to retire what we affectionately call some of the old clunkers. Um, we have a lot of what's called peaker power plants around Long Island, which they're very old, they're small, but when, the, um, when it's summer and we're putting on the air conditioner because we, we need it, a lot of these little old plants are turned on. They're called peaker because they're only used during the peak season. It will allow us to retire a lot of them, uh, and we also believe it's going to allow us to retire plants like uh, Port Jefferson, which is only used now less than 5% of the time, um, and perhaps even Northport and maybe Barrett. We don't know yet. But the point is we need to make the transition between solar, wind, and other things that uh, our next two speakers are going to talk about. This is how it happens. And honestly, I know this statement sounds dramatic, but it's true. If we change the way we produce energy, we can change the world. That is true. We go to war over oil. Uh, everything's based on oil and natural gas. Having wind power and solar makes us energy independent. We don't have to buy it from anybody. It's produced right here. It doesn't pollute. And it, uh, the cost of it is a known factor. How much is oil, how, anybody know, what did oil close at on Friday? I didn't check today. 120, very good. $120 a barrel. That's crazy. Did we know that last year? No, we did not. What was oil during the middle of COVID? It was down to $38 a barrel. If you chart oil on a chart, it looks like a heart attack patient. You know what the cost of wind is? It's the same. Because the cost of wind is building the wind farm and maintaining it. Those are known costs. We have to know it before they get the contract. And in the contract, it's called the PPA, Power Purchase Agreement, that they sign with LIPR, there is a known amount of cost that's in there for 20 years maybe 25, they're talking about doing 25 year power purchase, but 20 years. So the Department of Energy has said it adds stability to the rate base. Because no longer are we reliant on if something happens across the world or there's a war with Russia and the Ukraine or some kind of geopolitical occurrence. 
So I'm gonna stop there because we have two other wonderful speakers. Um, but the thing I just want you to know about offshore wind is that it's not the technology from 20 years ago. There's a lot of myths about it, and that's why we put together those five pieces. I know it was a lot, um, but it's a lot of good science-based information there where people have questions about offshore wind. Plus, we're gonna do a panel discussion, right, yeah, at the end. Yeah, we're gonna do some Q&A, so I'm happy to answer your questions. But anyway, thank you. Great stuff. Thank you, Adrian, great stuff. So as, so as Adrian said, there's definitely a lot of bad news, so to speak, when we talk about climate change, but there is good news. There is actions being taken, and uh, you know, I'm gonna reframe from asking the question, is offshore wind real anymore? Because I'm gonna listen to what Adrian's saying. It is real, it's happening, it's, it's big. It's gonna be uh, a real transformation of uh, not only how we're generating energy, and as she said, if we can change how we generate and produce energy, we can change the world. Look at what's going on with Russia invading Ukraine. How does a country get away with doing that? I mean, Russia, Putin's power, he's a petro dictator. It all comes from his ability to sell oil on the world market. If, if we didn't have that demand, if we had done what environmentalists have been calling for for decades, he would not have the power and the, the large army that he's able to fund with his, with his oil reserves. So the, the great points. Now let's move the discussion from this sort of um, what's happening in terms of major decisions about how energy is generated and policy changes and understanding the nature of the problem, talking a little bit more about what we can do as individuals. Uh, and we have some great guests for that purpose. So uh, Beth Fettini, Elizabeth, uh, is, she's the founder and director of a Long Island-based non-for-profit called Green Inside and Out. Beth has a master's degree in environmental law from Vermont Law School as well as 25 years of experience working in environmental movement and nonprofit organizations, both in DC and here in New York. She has worked for the New York State Department of Public Service on clean energy policy. She also worked at the Sustainability Institute at Moy College, good stuff. Um, she worked with Renewable Energy Long Island, the Community Development Corporation of Long Island under a contract with NYSERDA, and before all that, with Beyond Pest Pesticides. She is author of the book, The Green Wardrobe Guide, and I believe that I saw the book in the back, finding eco chic fashion that look great and help save the planet. Great name. Uh, she hosts an award-winning radio show uh, on the Stony Brook University Radio, WUSB, for seven years, and now hosts a monthly environmental uh, podcast. She, uh, I believe I saw she won a nice award for her podcast, so um, definitely check that out. Uh, Beth was awarded the Long Island Sierra Club Environmentalist of the Year back in 2017 and the EPA's Environmental Quality Award in 2010 and her work in co-creating educational materials for children's environmental health. Um, Beth offered a TEDx talk at Adelphi University. So those of you that are YouTube and watching us on YouTube, you could probably find that TEDx talk. Uh, back in March of 2018, it was titled The Toxic Talk, Your Power Over Pollutants. She's a trainee of the Climate Reality Organization formed by former Vice President Al Gore, and Beth has served on a number of Long Island environmental groups, and you can find uh, her work has been featured on outlets such as News 12, BIOS, Newsday, and The Long Islander. So, great stuff. Let's hear Beth Fettini. What can we do as individuals uh, to address climate change? Yes, I've worked for Neil for 12 years, and I'm going to be working with Rosemary. I think Adrian's the only one I haven't worked for on Long Island at this point. <laughs> I'm going to be working with the U.S. Green Building Council, so lots of good stuff. But I just spent six years working at the New York State Department of uh, uh, Public Service, working on clean energy policy. And one of the most exciting things to come out of the state in recent years was the CLCPA, which was the um, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. So I don't know if any of you have heard about that, but it set some very, very big targets. And part of what Adrian was just speaking about was that 9,000 megawatts of wind is part of the target for, for New York State. So much of that will be off Long Island. It also sets a target of 85% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 within our state, 100% zero emission electricity by 2040, 70% renewable energy by 2030. Um, there's actually a Climate Action Council that's working to set a path for New York State to achieve these goals. They produced a scoping plan to implement measures to achieve these goals with subcommittees or advisory panels 
focused on housing, transportation, land use, waste, agriculture, and also a focus on how we can achieve these goals while also considering issues of justice and social, uh, social fairness. So I wanted to mention that there is a comment period open on that scoping plan through well, July 1st. <laughs> <laughs> but you can comment on the New York State um, Climate Action Scoping Plan uh, by July 1st. So anyone can have their input on all of these subjects. So that's kind of the big level picture of New York State. But like Neil said, I want to talk about just five things that we each can do as individuals to address climate change. And um, there's so many things I could pick, but I just picked the first top five big ones that came to my, to my mind. So the first one, we talked a lot about fossil fuels, which we'll mention in a minute, but um, the first one might be one that you aren't as, uh, wouldn't necessarily think of as being a way to address climate change, and that is our food choices. So this one's for Carol. She was like, <laughs> let's see if you convince everyone to go vegan. <laughs> Well, um, I myself have been vegetarian for 30 years myself, since 1991, 31 years now. Um, and I wanted to point out that the meat and dairy industry is a driving force behind numerous types of environmental damage, including deforestation, erosion, and soil is a sequester of carbon, uh, overuse of fresh water, air and water pollution, climate change, and biodiversity loss. And that's, um, that's all coming from World Watch Institute. So in 2006, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO of the United Nations, released a report called Livestock's Long Shadow, estimating that animal farming is responsible for about 15% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So in 2010, the UN actually called, uh, they issued a report calling for an adoption of plant-based eating. 34% of, of the Earth's surface is used for raising animals for food. Animal agriculture is the main cause of deforestation due to grazing and clearing the land to grow feed crops. Animals raised for food in the U.S. consume 90% of the soy, corn, and grain uh, that we produce here in the United States. But uh, 1.4 billion humans could be fed by the grain and soy eaten by animals. So it's just a matter of um, proper distri distribution of, of resources. Um, a research team from Israel's Wiseman Institute of Science and Bard College here in New York um, considered what would happen if U.S. farmland currently devoted to raising cattle, pigs, and chickens was used to grow plants instead. What they found was that we could sustain the 327 million of, million of us here in the United States and an additional 390 million more people around the world. This would help to reduce global hunger. In terms of water usage, 64% of the world's population is expected to live in water-stressed areas by 2025. 70% of global water use is for the animal agriculture sector, mostly for irrigation of feed crops. So to produce one pound of beef, it takes 1,500 gallons of water. One gallon of milk takes 750 gallons of water. But meanwhile, one pound of wheat takes 120 gallons of water, and one pound of potatoes takes 12 gallons of water. And it's not just food. A pound of leather requires over 2,000 gallons of water, according to the Water Footprint Network. And by the way, re refer referencing my book, I am wearing hemp pants today, <laughs> <laughs> which is a very um, eco-friendly crop. And you know you can't smoke them. <laughs> it's, it's just hemp fiber. Um, a cow typically produces 30 gallons of manure a day. 200 cows can produce as much nitrogen in their manure as a town of 10,000 humans. So all of this manure running into waterways causes algal blooms. Algal blooms, that's hard to say. Part of the carbon impact is that cows also produce a lot of methane, about 25% of the methane produced in the United States, which is a potent heat-trapping heat greenhouse gas, which we already heard about. Th 13 of the world's 17%, sorry, 13 of the world's 17 fisheries are depleted or seriously in decline. Um, and they're being very much overexploited because everyone might think, well, let's just all eat fish. And now, of course, we know there's plastics in the oceans as well. That's another problem. But we need our oceans to be healthy in order to have a healthy climate because we already heard about the fact that the oceans are absorbing all this, this carbon. So everything is related. 
So there's so many resources on this. I'll leave you with um, Sustainability Institute has a lot of resources on this. There's a group I like called Vegan Outreach. Um, there's good news in the fact that there are millions and millions of people sort of going towards vegetarianism or at least you know reducing their meat in intake. Everyone can do a little something. It's a decision we make three times a day, right? Um, and uh, there's, there's yeah, <laughs> sometimes more. Um, and there are so many resources online. So that's that one. Number two out of the five, reducing waste, especially our food. About 15% of Long Island's waste is made up of food scraps. When this goes into landfills and breaks down, it also creates methane, that's, which is a potent greenhouse gas. Much of it here is going to incinerators or even being trucked off of Long Island to Ohio and Pennsylvania, which leads to even more greenhouse gas emissions. And all of this food waste could be converted into valuable compost to add nutrients to the soil because the soil worldwide is becoming eroded and depleted of nutrients. So it's just a matter of keeping a small bin on your countertop, which I do at home, and having either a pile or a tumbler in the backyard. Uh, you, you mix the food scraps with brown, such as dried leaves, and as long as it's in balance, it will not smell. That's, that's another myth that compost smells. It only smells if you don't turn it and give it some oxygen. <laughs> um, so many communities around New York State are establishing curbside food waste recycling, where the town comes and picks up the food waste, just like it would you pick up your recycling on the curb. So that's very exciting to see. Um, New York City has drop-off sites all around the city where scraps are being collected and composted. But I have to say, not too much happening here on Long Island. So in the last year, myself and a bunch of others formed the Long Island Organics Council. So we're trying to help some of the towns on Long Island to establish food scrap recycling programs. So if anyone here has contacts with the town and you'd like to talk to me about this, I'd be happy to, to speak to someone. I know um, legislator Deborah Moulet, I don't know if she covers this area, but somewhere down here and she does. Okay, she's very interested, so I'm going to go talk to her. <laughs> so I need your support. Um, uh, they're, they're doing community composting in Port Washington where like 10 or 12 families drop off their food scraps and somebody turns it. So they have a nice system going. That's a great thing. You could even do that here at the temple. Churches and schools could all be setting up compost piles and re reusing their food scraps. So um, again, it's Long Island Organics Council if anyone wants to try and find us on Facebook. Um, another quick thing I wanted to point out is clothing waste. So 10% of our waste is textiles and, and fibers, which again, when they go to landfills, break down into methane. So another thing that we can do is recycle our clothing by you know, bringing them for donation. And there's a paper in the back that we wrote with a whole list of places across Long Island where you can bring your clothes to be recycled. Number three, going back to our use of fossil fuels. Obviously, addressing our energy use at home. So the first thing I always recommend is for people to get a free home energy audit. So PSEG Long Island offers free assessments where a professional will come in and do a blower door test and they'll see where your house is leaking and tell you how to save energy by improving usually the insulation and also perhaps upgrading equipment in your house to be you know, energy efficient, like Energy Star labeled, for example. Um, right now, there's a lot of incentives being offered to increase the number of houses using heat pumps rather than gas because the state is trying to move away from the use of more natural gas because it's a, still a fossil fuel, even though it burns cleaner. There's still a lot of emissions from that. Um, and so, you know, one of the great uh, resources that we have through Sustainability Institute is the, a program called Long Island Green Homes, where they can help, you know, sort of uh, forward you to the right person to help you get this free home energy audit. So Long Island Green Homes, very easy to remember, .org. And also you can do solar, like we heard about. Um, I always recommend buying solar panels rather than doing a lease, because the numbers tend to work out a little bit better. Um, you have a great company right down in this area called Empower Solar. I don't know if I'm allowed to name a name, but there's many great uh, solar companies <laughs> on Long Island. Um, you know, and PSEG maintains the list. You can look on their, their website. Um, and you can do community solar. That's what I do at my house, because my house is too old, the roof is too old to do solar panels, and there's a lot of trees. So what I do is there's a, a solar array that's out in Shelter Island, out in a field, and I buy shares in it and it saves me money on my bill. So you don't have to have the panels on your house, you can buy into one of those and buy the shares. And it saves, I've saved several cents per kilowatt hour every month. Um, and <laughs> while that's going on, I also 
bring you to number four, drive an electric vehicle. <laughs> so Rosemary, of course, is going to cover this. Um, but if you must drive, um, you know, choosing an efficient vehicle or choosing either a hybrid or full electric car is the way to go. The state is, uh, New York State is a ZEV state. It's one of a coalition of states across uh, the U.S. Um, and we have a goal that basically collectively have a goal of putting more EVs on the road. And for New York State, the number is 800,000 EVs by 2025. And we're now at 100,000. So basically, we need to make that eight m times more <laughs> in the next four years. So we have, a big, uh, we have a big way to go, three years, I should say. Um, there's numerous models available. Um, they really reduce your emissions. Um, so of course, Rosemary's going to talk about all this. But um, just for some fun stuff, you know, I did drive a Prius for 17 years. It went 250,000 miles. I sold it to my friend who runs the elect the, another electric uh, car association, and he fixed it up, and now he's got it up to 300,000 miles. And now I drive a little BMW i3, which I bought used. It sounds so fancy, but I got it for on sale. <laughs> um, and it's really great. I drove all the way up to Albany and back, just charging you know, in public stations. And it was great. I always charge at home. I have a charger at home. So anyone can ask me about that later, so I don't take too much time. Um, number five, the biggest thing we can do is how we vote. We elect, um, you know, who we elect really matters. Um, policy decisions are, and you know, where our tax dollars go, and you know, these people are making decisions about this. It makes a huge difference as to where resources go towards good projects. Like the governor is, you know, being a real leader by emphasizing offshore wind, for example. You know, the, if we had different leadership, that might not be happening. So resources on that, of course, are citizens' campaign for the environment, and of course, you can listen to my Green Inside and Out podcast. So I think with that, um, I'll hand it off to Rosemary, right? Great stuff, Beth. All right. Five things you can do and lots of real specific uh, advice and actions you can take. What's, and food. Uh -huh. You can use these bags and they make your vegetables last longer. Can I say, I'm addicted to these bags. Uh -huh. Aren't they cool? <laughs> they're wonderful. They save you money. There you yeah, go. They save you money. See, these are the things you got to learn. That's why you came out today to get some real uh, handy uh, advice, things that you can do. So let me read the uh, intro for our last speaker um, and then just say a word. So, Rosemary Miscali. Rosemary got her uh, bachelor's degree in management and computer applications and information systems from NYU Stern School of Business. She is the chair and education uh, outreach, uh, she's chair of the education and outreach subcommittee of the Drive Electric Long Island Vehicle Coalition. She's the co-chair of the USGBC Long Island. So USGBC, that's the green building um, not-for-profit. I happen to be on their board of directors. And one of the things they always say, it's not just about the buildings. And so they do have a transportation committee that she's uh, co-chairing. The Drive Electric Long Island is a coalition of electric vehicle stakeholders led by um, the USGBC. And um, their goal is to accelerate that adoption of electric vehicles that Bess was just talking about. Um, Rosemary is out there talking to the public all the time, so I don't want to say too much more. Let's get her to come on up here. Everybody's upset about energy prices. The price of gasoline makes electrics more appropriate now than ever. Is it time for electric? Let's do it. Time for electric. Okay, everybody's been telling you about what the climate change impact is. I know it. I have a house out in East Quag on the bay, and I flooded with Sandy. I flooded with Irene, fixed the house, and got back in three months later, flooded again with Sandy. Now I'm, it's 18 steps up to get to my first floor because oh. I'm on piling. So, and I've been watching the bay growing. You know, we've been there 35 years and I can see the difference in the water. So, uh, you know, definitely know it's real, uh, which is one of the reasons that I've been focusing on sustainable transportation. Um, one of it, you know, one area is just driving less, using mass transit, biking, walking. It's good for our health as well. But 70% of people drive alone in Nassau County and 80% of people drive alone in Suffolk County. So when I look at those numbers and everything we've done to try to promote all the alternatives, it pretty much stays that way. So what we can do, and probably the most important thing that we can do here to impact greenhouse gases on Long Island is to switch to electric. So my next 10 minutes is going to basically tell you why you should do that. So first of all, transportation on Long Island, it counts for about 30% of our greenhouse gases. 
And you can say, wow, that's a big number. Why? Because we have two million registered cars on Long Island. Two million registered cars. It's 2.3 cars per, um, per household in Suffolk and 2.2 cars per household in Nassau County. Well, the way I look at it is if we have 2.2, if there's any concern about rage anxiety, okay, keep one for your long trips and do the other. We'll get to 50% tomorrow if we had supply. So if, if you're serious about what you want to do about climate change, we can convert everything to renewables. The power can be there all for electric. But if we're driving our petroleum-based cars, they can't use electric. Almost every other appliance in your home uses electric your blow dryer, your phone, everything uses electric, but we, we go around with, with gas in our cars. And there's a good reason for that. When cars first came out, electric came out at the same time that gas cars came, but the battery technology wasn't there and the fossil fuels were very cheap, and so it just, they just took off and it was just too expensive to have electric and it couldn't compete with the range you could get on gas. That's changed now. Now the, the range in batteries, the cost of batteries has really come down, and the incentives that you can have that really bridge that last gap, you can get up to a $7,500 federal tax credit, and you can get up to $2,000 from, from the state as a rebate. You combine that with the reducing costs and all the investments that the other manufacturers are making. There used to be just a couple of models available, little tiny ones. People say, oh, that's not the kind of car I want. There's over 40 models now. I was at the New York Auto Show. 15 manufacturers had 40 models on display at the Javits Center. It was like a total electric car show, <laughs> you would think. <laughs> so there's, there's all kinds of models. There's pickup trucks, there's SUVs, there's crossovers, there's sedans. Before, and I could see why. People you know, d didn't just want to you know, buy any car. There's a lot of reasons why we decide to buy a car what kind of car it is, how much money we want to spend, uh, the dealership maybe we have loyalty to, the brand we have loyalty to. Now all of those, you have tons and tons of choices So from there. So first, environmentally, it's the way we're going to mostly impact greenhouse gases. It's not just greenhouse gases, though. Do you know our air quality on Long Island is an F? Uh, on the thing, you say, well, how can that be? Well, is it in New York City? No, we're an F. In, in there's two areas that they measure air quality. One is particulate matter. We're not too bad in that. Bad, but not that bad. But ground level ozone, which happens in the summer when it gets hot and all those two million cars are fuming all around, it just builds up. And people with COPD or asthma or other, you know, young children really are impacted by it. And it's only going to get worse if we continue uh, with, with these kind of vehicles. So by moving to electric, you, as all this wind power comes on board, that car that you're driving, first it has zero tailpipe emissions. If you look in the back of, a, uh, of an EV, there's no tailpipe because it doesn't have a <laughs> catalytic converter, it doesn't have any of that stuff because it doesn't have all the parts that an internal combustion engine has. And so locally, there's none of that pollutants going into the air. And from a, you know, the, the cost of uh, the, the pollutants from the power plants, over time, that same car is going to get cleaner and cleaner because the power plant is, is being changed over from those old yucky clunkers. ones, clunkers, uh, to wind power and solar power, solar power. And New York State actually, on a broad basis, does well because we do, do a lot of hydropower and nuclear power. So from a state standpoint, we actually are pretty good already. But as Adrian pointed out in Long Island, we need uh, to get there. So environmentally, both greenhouse gases and our uh, air quality. Dollars-wise, you've got all these incentives now. They're, got, they're not going to be here forever. Two manufacturers already have lost the $7,500 rebate, Tesla and Chevy, because uh, the way it was set up was up to 200,000 cars from a particular manufacturer, and then those incentives go away. So if you're thinking about it, now's a good time where you can get another 70, up to $7,500. There is actually in the budget reconciliation bill that they're considering right now, the possibility that they could put more money in and actually restore that, we hope so, but uh, there's no guarantee on that. The other savings you get is I, I mentioned all the parts that aren't in this vehicle. There was a study that over the course of 10 years, you'll save about $5,000 in maintenance costs. 
because all those parts that you're used to repairing on your uh, regular internal combustion engine, like your oil, your fan belts, your air filters, your timing belts, your heat gaskets, your cylinder heads, your spark plugs, your c catalytic converter, your all that, it's not in, it's not in. A, it, electric cars don't have those parts. You have the battery, and you have an electric motor, and you have windshield wipers, <laughs> you know, and, uh, but, yes? I have a question. Um, what is the plan to propose charging stations? Because I did buy a hybrid, and I have not put a charger in my home yet. And I can go to the Freeport train station and plug in for three hours, or I have to go to Valley Street to Greenwood Mall, which, by the way, was really difficult to find because they're just these things in the middle of the mall, and I had to be on the phone with the company to find them. <laughs> so I bought the car, and now the infrastructure is not in place for me to... Uh, what, uh, do you have a single-family home, or do you have a... I do, and I, and I plan on putting that in. Yeah, because you can, you can, and do you have a full electric or a plug-in hybrid? So. Plug plug-in hybrid okay so what we were just discussing for those that uh, aren't familiar with electric vehicles I'll give you a little brief of our EV 101 which I we've been doing around the libraries so we can offer you to to come for the 45 minute version but there are uh, three types of electric vehicles everybody's pretty familiar with the Priuses that was just a, just a hybrid then there is a plug-in hybrid and a full electric the plug-in hybrid is similar to the hybrid except it has a larger battery and it can give you somewhere between 25 to 50 miles of range. You can go that many miles before it then kicks over into your gas engine. The full electric has a range anywhere, you know, the, the lowest ones today are like 150 to like 350, some approaching 400 miles of range, depending on the size of the battery. In, in your case where you have a plug-in hybrid, um, it doesn't take, there, and that, now let me give the other part of the basics, is how do you charge an electric vehicle? First, 85% of homes on Long Island are single family homes. People live in single family homes. That's a big percentage. If you look, go into the city, it's in the 40s or something like that. There's a lot of apartment buildings and issues like that, which makes us a great market for electric vehicles because people can put uh, can plug in right at home, whether in their driveway or in their garage. It could be you know, outside, it doesn't have to be inside. Um, then there are three ways to charge. One is you're just your regular 110 outlet, like that. That's, that's type one charging. You just plug in your adapter into that. The problem with that is it's a little slow. You get about three or four miles of range per hour. But if you're only driving 40 miles, say, in the day on your plug-in hybrid, you could just plug into that, and overnight you'll get most of that range back. I, I tried, but it doesn't work. For, okay, so the, but, but the other, the second one is a Type 2 charger. With that, you would install a, um, a 240 outlet, kind of like what you use for your dryer. Um, and it has more juice kind of going to it. Well, with that, you get 20 to 30 miles per hour. And PSEG has a, fi a $500 rebate to pay for the cost of the charger. You'd still have to pay your electrician, potentially, depends on if you have a box that has a, a room in it, you know, um, switches, uh, and, and where you want to put the, the charge, but then that's a one-time installation that you'd have uh, for, the, for the time. Um, if, you do, if you don't have uh, the ability to charge at home, because most people, 90% of the time, will, will charge at home. It's like, you know, where's, where's my phone? Give me, your, give me your phone. Do you go to the gas station to charge this up? No, you plug it in at night, and in the morning it's charged up. That's one of the advantages of an electric vehicle, that you, don't, you just plug it in at night. You don't have to waste your time going to, to, the, to the gas station. But if you're going on trips where you need more than your range, you're going down to Florida, you're going up to Albany, you're going to Boston, Yes, you need um, uh, uh, to go to a charging station. And we're working, uh, we have, a, I chair the Education Outreach Committee. We have another um, committee in our coalition, the EV Infrastructure Committee, that's working to get uh, NIPA is one thing, putting in DC fast charges. They're actually having an event at the end of June to celebrate their 100th uh, DC fast charge station they put in New York State. 
Uh, Electrify America, that's another group that's putting in DC fast chargers. Tesla has put a whole network. So some people buy Teslas because they have their private network of, of Tesla uh, stations that they have exclusive access to. Um, but yes, we need more charging infrastructure. But I always like to point out that it's not like, you can't think in terms of the mindset of a gas station. You don't always fuel your vehicle by going to the gas station. Most of the time, you plug it in at home. Uh, yes? Yeah, and actually, the state is prioritizing putting in more infrastructure. So actually, there's, I forget how many millions of dollars that's being put into more infrastructure. And there's a certain target of however many thousand, I believe, statewide. I forget the number. I'm sorry off the top of my yes. head. Yes. But it's definitely a priority because the state is aware that it, there's a great need. And, and there's, doing some studies to evaluate what are the best places to put them that make the most sense. And there's federal funding for this coming down the pipe as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's funding available through the utility to help businesses and, and entrepreneurs and uh, uh, pay for some of those what they call make ready costs to also enable it. So there's a lot of funding and a lot of resources looking at the expansion of that. And I don't want to minimize that, that that is absolutely needed. But I also don't want people to go away saying, oh, I can't get a car until all those um, charging stations are in place because 90% of the time you're going to be plugging in at night and charging at night. And that's, and that's the most convenient. Right, driving one, right? Sure. What is the cost to replace one of those batteries? Maybe and we don't dispose of the batteries. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost done, and then we're going to do a we'll panel thing, if you want to do it. Yeah, so if I can just finish. Well, my oh. question is, what is the cost? Okay. Okay, I'm almost done anyway, so go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. What is the cost to replace one of those batteries? And have they gotten a system where they can dispose of those batteries? Yes, For instance, the I'm batteries you have now are lead acid batteries. Yeah. Where are they going to dispose it? Okay. Into the ground? Yeah, no, let me, let me take them one at a time. On the first question, the uh, cost of today of completely replacing the battery is about a $10,000 item, depends on the battery and the stuff. But those batteries are made up of a lot of little small batteries. So depending on what the issue was, they can replace pieces of it. The other thing is almost all of the electric vehicles have a 10 year, 100,000 mile warranty on the battery. So if something should happen outside of it, it's, it'll the be covered under your come warranty. Some place. There's no free lunch. No. 17 years. Well, <laughs> there's, yeah. Still got 50 yeah. Miles but per on your question about um, what do you do with the batteries, 95%. Well, the battery goes, goes uh, wears away occasionally, right? There's a cost to replace the battery, there's a cost of energy. You have that battery in the car for all that extra weight. So now you're losing energy on the other end and you're charging it in your house the other way. No, it doesn't work that way. The, uh, the uh, uh, miles per gallon uh, equivalent of, a, of the typical for electric car is over 100 miles per gallon, if you looked at it I have equivalent. a little junky car in Florida, a Toyota. It gets 39.9 .9 miles on a highway. What else can I ask for? How many miles do you drive a year? In Florida, I drive quite a bit. How many about? I, I don't know. 10,000 miles? Here I go to the store and back. If you told me, if you, told me you, do, you drive about 1,000 miles a year, I'd say, yeah, you're probably right. But if you drive 10,000, 12,000 miles a year, like we do, it's about a pound of carbon dioxide per mile you drive. So if you drive 12,000 miles, you're putting, you know, 12,000 uh, 12, uh, pounds of of carbon dioxide, you divide by 2,000, that's six tons of carbon dioxide you're putting into the air when, when you're driving. And that's why, that's why it's 30% of the greenhouse gases on and Long Island. So if you're not driving much, yeah, it's not a priority. F hit, hit your heat pump, hit your air conditioning. That would probably do you more. Next question. Well, actually, she's saying maybe we could, uh, our hostess is yeah. saying maybe we could round it up and oh. she's going like this. Oh, okay. no, I didn't mean to cut off Rosie. Oh, oh I Oh, no, okay. that's what, no. Oh, 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 okay, so. Yeah. Okay. yeah, go ahead. I just want to go back to the person who was talking about um, charging the car. You know, we just bought an electric car recently, and we were traveling on the road. What model did you buy? Uh, we bought the Volvo. Oh, yeah, uh, actually. That's a, the Volvo is a hybrid. It's a hybrid. It's a hybrid. Plug-in hybrid? No, pure, no, pure, pure electric. electric. Okay, what's the range and, um, on? My son, um, 200. 200 miles. Okay, and my son taught me um, to look at it differently, that when you're traveling, 
don't go to the closest place. So maybe if you have to go five miles out of your way, what you're going to find there are 15 DC fast chargers. That's the way to go. So it was just a different mindset, and it really worked wonderful. Right, and most of the vehicles will tell you where to go. If you put your navigation in, it'll say, okay, at this point, you're going to need to stop to charge, and you'll stop there and go from there. So there's a lot of smarts in it. With, so you don't have to be ferrying out where, where is it. Yeah, because we thought we had to go, like, right where we are going to pass it. Like, you know, you're driving, you're going to pass the car, you know, right? The gas station's there. He's like, no, no, you go a little out of the way, and it's so much better. Yeah. You know, so we actually went to... Oh, we actually found a, a Walmart that we went to, and we charged, and we did our food shopping, and it was fully charged. You know, so <laughs> and that's where, where they are putting a lot of these charging stations, is not typically where at a gas station where you're just in where the, where's the gas tank under the ground. They're putting it in places where you can stop. Uh, so, so a DC fast charge would... Yes, you can do your shopping, or you can do your thing. Right, right. The... Uh, Amazon Fresh has two Volta high-speed uh, DC chargers. They're opening up, I think, on the 19th of next month. Mm -hmm. But uh, along, along any of the interstate highways, you're within a mile or two of a Walmart or a Target or yeah, that's something the, of that. Yeah, that's the, the priority is to, is to put them first as DC fast chargers, which is the fast way of charging. I talked about the Type 1 and Type 2. The, the DC fast chargers takes anywhere between 15 and 30 minutes to give you 80% of your charge. So that, that becomes more like the gas station model, but they put it around shopping centers or around places to eat. So you go, you go, hit the head, well, do, do whatever. But somebody was saying she didn't know if they could operate it. Ours operates like a regular car. The steering wheel's the same, the drive and the shift and everything's the same, the gas pedal's the same. We're not driving differently. Which brings me to the pledge I would like you to all take today, and that is to consider your next car to be an EV and to make a pledge to test drive one. There's a lot of different choices now. You can choose between a big car or a little car, a, any color car, <laughs> a plug-in hybrid, a full electric, but go to your favorite dealer. They, they'll have them now, you know, they'll, they'll have that as an option, and test drive it, because you'll find that they're quiet, they're fast, because you have better torque on it, and it's a good time uh, to consider it and to buy because the car you buy today if you buy an internal combustion engine Whether you whether you lease it for three years or you sell it in a few years It's going to be on the road for 15 years putting out six tons of carbon dioxide for the next 15 years The electric car you buy today might still have some equivalent of, of Carbon because you know, it's, it's running electricity that's being run, you know fueled by gas but over time, as that switches to solar and to wind power, that same car is going to be using zero green, greenhouse gases. So it makes a big difference to not wait. Let's not put any more of those cars on the road. I have a really... The cost to charge, uh, it, the, the cost per gallon equivalent, is what they say, is about a thirty a gallon. So right now we're spending $5 a gallon. That's the difference you've got right now. Uh, not for not for charging. No, no. For for the car itself, they bumped up a little bit. Yeah. But the charge. Uh, yeah. No. Most you'd be charging at home, too. And and oh, and and PSEG just came out with a time of use rate, so you have to look at your other energy usage. But right now we're paying twenty one, twenty two cents a kilowatt hour on your normal plan. You can get it for about twelve cents a kilowatt hour overnight with the time of use plan. You have to make sure what your daily usage of is, because during that peak hour, they're going to charge you like 40 cents a kilowatt hour, because they really want you to shop, not. I have a question. So the charge. Well, and, and we're working with companies to, like Estee Lauder in Melville. They have 20 charging stations for their employees, and they're offering it as a benefit. So we're working with companies to try to get them to put workplace charging in as well, because some people who have a longer commute. It, it'll, you know, it'll give them a little more impetus to, to dry electric. Okay, just, just two, two points. I, I, one is a question and the other. You talked about the DC being um, that fast that it charges between 15 and 30 minutes, right? The, the uh, DC between chargers? Between 15 and, and, and 30 minutes to do 80% uh, of your charge. Are they going to um, do something that's more efficient where it would be even quicker? Because a lot of people think about 
well, it takes me five minutes just to fill up my gas, you know, a gas tank and just get on and, and get going. And if you're doing long distances, you know, there's a time factor um, to think about. And then the second thing I wanted to say was more of a, I don't know if anyone knows about it or, or for those that have an electric vehicle, there is a great charging station down by Jones Beach by the Nature Center. Yeah. They have a, a ton of, of uh, chargers there, probably the super ones or the, I don't know what kind they are, but also yeah, for those that might have a, a vehicle and don't know about that one, it's, it's yeah, there, very nice. Yeah, there is a, uh, in the back I have a top reasons to uh, buy an electric vehicle. On the back are some uh, resources, some links, and one of them is uh, a station locator. And it shows where all the, um, where they are across the United States, but you can zero in on Long Island. And if you click one of the little green circles, it'll tell you whether it's a Type 2, a DC fast charger, everything about it. Um, there's, there's, and I really would encourage you, if you go, to, we have our website, check our website for when our next EV 101 is. We actually have one Wednesday night at Hopog Library, but we have a whole slew of them coming up. Uh, and just come by. Or we, or we can do it here down in Oceanside at the library if you coordinate it. Or come back here and, and do it. It's about a 45 minute goes into more detail with everything I was just discussing. Is it, I'm sorry, is it then uh, a good time to think about switching to t total electric? Yeah, why don't we do our panel because then we can broaden it to, yes. um, to not just cars. Okay, so let me, so let me, re great, thank you Rosemary, great job. Thank you. Great stuff. Um, so, so let me restate that question and also throw it to, Beth, you want to take a shot at that? So I also throw it to Beth in the sense that um, the first question you heard was a question you and I have heard repeatedly. So we used to always go to events, and you were the first person I knew that had an electric hybrid vehicle, the Prius, which I had for a number of years also. And what was always the first question was, yeah, but you're going to get stuck with replacing the battery in five years, and isn't that going to leave you with like this huge bill? And of course, catalytic converters are very expensive, but we don't focus on that. But you're going to get stuck with this big battery bill. So how did that work out for you with your Prius? Yeah, I was saying, I, can you hear me? I was saying before, um, I never actually changed the battery in my Prius at all after 17 years. So now it's 18 years old and still on the original battery and still getting 50 miles per gallon. Yeah. So, so it's pretty amazing. I was, I was worried about that too. I was like, mm, this is going to cost me a few thousand bucks someday and it just never happened. Okay. So, so the other, the question from the gentleman was that, you know, the, we, we can't just, you know, satisfy ourselves with some of the topics covered. We need to really take a look at our households, for example. You talked about other things that we do individually, our food choices and such. But when we look at the households, we could convert uh, to electric cooking. As much as the people don't love the old-fashioned electric, there's, there's new conduction heating uh, stoves and such. And um, so you want to say anything on that? There's also the Air Force um, heating that you can, you know, mini splits and whatnot. And so Yeah, so the state has a huge push towards heat pumps to electrify buildings. Like building electrification is the new buzzword because there is a goal of moving all of our buildings in New York State off of natural gas and not expanding the gas network because I'm sure many of us are aware natural gas is being, you know, dug up and you know via fracking and hydro fracking which causes all kinds of problems with chemicals and all sorts of things so um, there's a lot of incentives now incentive money being put towards heat pumps they can be a few thousand dollars but if you go on the PSEG website you'll see there's the air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps which are known as geothermal um, so those are really good options to look into and that's why I was saying the first thing I would start with is a home energy audit because then you have a professional come to the house and they can tell you all of your different options and you can pick their brain about it. Yeah, good stuff. And uh, yes, let's take some more questions. So the lady with the hand up. Yeah. This may seem like a, a very silly question, but in terms of moving towards a more vegan, vegetarian kind of, of culture, what happens with the animals? How do we... How do we deal with reducing that size, that population? What incentives are there going to be? I mean, it seems to me an entire societal shift has to happen 
um, sort of the way you, you might want to move a political movement. Um, what do we do with the cows and the sheep and the chickens and the goats? <laughs> Sure. So actually, you know, something that I should have mentioned too is that we're actually breeding animals. And so billions of animals are being unnaturally produced. I don't want to go into the gory details of how that happens, but it's not pleasant. <laughs> These are not just, you know, cows roaming around in a field naturally um, mating. They're, we're actually breeding billions of them to be slaughtered every year. So it's, it's a matter of just kind of ramping that down. And of course, the, the agriculture industry is fighting against it. I mean, I used to work in Washington, D.C. and see the people with the cowboy hats going through the halls of Congress because they want to keep their business going. Very but they, powerful they, lobby. Very powerful lobby. But they, but they see the writing on the wall, and there's more and more awareness. So eventually, you know, things will slowly start to ramp down as there's more and more awareness. There's a lot of young people interested in this and wanting to make changes. So it, it's really encouraging. Sure. What, I mean, I remember reading about it 10 or 15 years ago, and whatever happened to the carbon capture and sequestration? Wh where is that technology? <laughs> um, the unicorn, which you are discussing, um, it's just not really working like they thought. You know, the idea was to capture it and store it in salt domes or, or this or that, but you know, carbon, a gas, has a way of seeping out. It's like water. It's going to find its way out. So our organization are not big supporters of carbon sequestration because the pilots that were done um, over time were found to be leaking. Um, it could store it for a little bit of time, but it doesn't solve the problem. It just um, postpones it to a future date. And the real way to t uh, tackle this problem is to not produce the carbon in the first place. But I'm glad you asked that. They still talk about it a lot, but it's not really a proven technology. It's not working. It's also really expensive. Okay. So, you know, if, if, you, if you can generate power through renewables that's cheaper than fossil fuels, why would you generate power through fossil fuels and then spend extra money to recapture the carbon? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. And while the professor has the microphone, so we also hear about the Keystone XL pipeline extension, and that the fact that that got canceled um, was why our oil prices are going through the roof. Um, you know, you talked about how there's an up and down in the market, sort of, it's built into the market that, it, that the price was as low as you said, $38 during the pandemic, and now 120 Right, right. they... American oil companies are not rushing to increase production right now. They don't have a reason to. And they, they're... And sure. Um, and they don't, they don't want to invest all this money in ramping up production if um, there's going to be a global recession in another year and demand is going to plummet. So they're being very... They've, they've just been burned multiple times. Um, when, when I started graduate school, uh, I was 23 years old, and I was the youngest graduate student in the Department of Geology at Virginia Tech by like eight years, because all the other grad students had been working in the uh, petroleum industry, and they all got laid off um, during the you know, recession in the, in the 80s. And so they, had, they all decided, oh, might as well go back to school, right? So it's a, right? it's a boom and bust industry. Right, it's a boom and bust industry. You've seen this before. So what you're seeing right now doesn't surprise you. No, it's no. It's not some conspiracy. It's not some one project was canceled that was going to do an extension. No, it's just the nature of fossil fuels. Yeah. <laughs> it's also, in addition to the nature of fossil fuels, um, you know, Biden did go to OPEC about seven months ago and said, can you please ramp up uh, production? And they were like, yeah, no. <laughs> so it's exactly what the professor was saying. That why would they? They're getting a lot of money now. You probably saw a news report come out yesterday that um, ExxonMobil had the highest profits ever reported in a quarter by any, any industry uh, ever on the globe. So what's their incentive to produce more? Zero. And I also mentioned, I'll throw the next question here, but I also mentioned, you mentioned Exxon. So there's a uh, PBS program that was done about a month ago. It's relatively new, but it basically was the fact that Exxon was the one that learned about climate change early on, where they had extra money back in the 70s, so they hired a team of scientists, 
and they did original research, and they basically put the whole story of climate change together. Am I exaggerating that? I mean, some 50, 70 years ago. And so here we are struggling with something that the oil companies knew a long time ago, and today they're making a fortune as we're continuing the struggle. So okay. question. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Well, we keep are saying, and even the president is saying, we have to become less dependent on foreign oil. We need to move off foreign oil altogether and start thinking about renewable energy. We've heard this before. Yes. When are we going to really get it? <laughs> Good question. I think we accept that as a challenge. So, and we'll take that question as a challenge. So, who, any other questions is where I think we passed the 9 o'clock hour, or we can take a few more, maybe? Uh, he's got the mic, so let's give it to them, and then we'll bring it up towards the second row. Hi, so I'm here with, uh, I'm a member of uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Beth is actually a, a familiar face. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, our organization, we lobby every member of Congress and Senator twice a year, and we do a lot of state level stuff too. Um, and this is like just a general question to the panel, I guess. If you had one piece of legislation that you're familiar with that, you know, someone like myself or anybody here could call or, or meet with their re representative on the state or federal level, what piece of legislation do you think we should go and talk to at uh, an elected official's office? Okay, so there's a couple of hands up, so maybe we just take that real quick. Can I Lobby bill. <laughs> this is not you guys. <laughs> well, I know Citizens Climate Lobby has for years been working on, um, like, I, I forget what it was called, a, a, like a reduce and dividend. Carbon fee and dividend. Carbon fee and dividend, where basically um, there would be a fee on carbon and then that fee would go back to consumers. So it would just, um, you know, reduce our, it would be a big incentive to reduce our use of carbon. So it's one idea that's been floated for several years. And also one thing I should mention that's kind of exciting is New York is uh, one of the REGI states, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So it's one of 11 states on the East Coast that form, form together to do a cap and trade system to lower the amount of emissions that are allowed out of our power plants. And we, the Northeast took leadership on that because the national, you know, the federal government wasn't doing it. So uh, that's really um, helped a lot because the sale of these pollution credits, so to speak, goes into a bucket, and that's what funds a lot of our clean energy programs. I'll throw one in on the town level, across the towns of across Long Island. Uh, it would be great if they upgraded their codes. Um, you can build a commercial building that leaks like a sieve in terms of its energy use. Um, the standards are really, really lax. We think that, that the standards should be elevated, so there is a recommendation. Uh, for a New York stretch energy code, which is purely voluntary, each town has to decide. We've been working for two years, we've only got two towns out of 13 to adopt it, uh, South Hampton and East Hampton. So all the other towns could be asked uh, to adopt the stretch energy code. Additionally, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, the Sustainability Institute and Lloyd College wrote a white paper calling for a requirement for solar as a mandate, basically, for all new commercial buildings. And we set it as three watts per foot of the building's footprint. So we have a specific formula in there. We reviewed a number of model codes. We feel very strongly that legislation is ready to go. We just need a town with some uh, courage. Well, I would do, I just want to add, I would do that on the state level. I mean, if I had one more thing to do, is that there's no reason why New York State um, shouldn't pass a bill that requires all new development, commercial and residential, to have solar power. It just, it, you know, California's doing that. Uh, I think that that is something that is real, it's doable, it's necessary. Why are we building new homes, um, you know, with oil tanks? It, you know, we're trying to phase it out now, on one hand, but the other hand, we're still building new homes with oil tanks. So um, that would be one thing I think would really get us a, a long way. What about current homes? Well, well, current homes would be the next phase um, to transform. There are actually a lot of great incentives for solar, I have to say. But that's another thing we could do is ramp up the incentives for people to make the transition to solar for their homes and businesses. Um, the more incentives, the more homes make the transition. That actually works. We know that works. We have the data on that. So that's a good point. But Thank with you. those existing homes, it's homeowners like yourselves that have to make the choice. So let's hit the one. Uh, I don't know where's that mic. I just have one, one quick one. We, we, just, sure. we had our committee meeting this morning, and one of the people brought up uh, that there's a current New York State Senate Bill S-23B, 
which will require construction of certain parking facilities to be capable of supporting electric vehicle charging stations. So if, if while they're building the facility, they put in all the conduits, the wire, and all that stuff, then it's easy to put it in. So that would be one that's, that's being considered right now. Well, was, I guess, the legislative session end. But. A lot, a lot of what I've heard tonight uh, relates to the individual person. Your own home, your own auto, your own way of eating and shopping and buying clothing and everything else. But the United States doesn't ex we don't exist in a vacuum. Most of our stuff is trucked in. And as we've learned in the last two years, everything depends on overseas shipping and national trucking. Are there any plans to make trucks electric? Yes, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. Because, yes. uh, I mean... UPS uh, trucks, uh, postal uh, trucks are now going electric? Yes. Yeah, in, in terms of the, the broad of range of, of models available, they're, they're looking not only at light-duty vehicles, which is what we drive, okay. but medium and heavy-duty. School, bus, school, bus school buses, too. School, school buses, a lot of like, New yeah. York City buses. I know the Long Beach City School District has electric buses, yeah. And uh, I just happened to have to stop to charge my car when I was Delaware State, the rest of the on 95, and there must have been 25 truck charging stations. And this is one area where the federal government could act quickly to say all government vehicles should be electric vehicles. I mean, it's, it's an area where, you know, you mentioned the uh, postal, so, I mean, look at all those vehicles, they could all be converted, so, uh, yeah. I notice nobody has addressed the issue of recycling. My little blue bin has given way to a full-size blue garbage can, and I find I need it because the packaging has gotten worse rather than better. And I have a feeling that nobody is picking up my newspapers. Uh, they're just throwing them right on the truck. Um, what's happening with garbage recycling? Oh my God, I, I know. If it's a good sewage discussion of garbage, I'm your woman. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, that's another whole presentation, to be honest with you. But solid waste management here on Long Island um, really, again, also needs to be overhauled. We worked so hard this year, and this would be another bill I would add to the list, um, but it was called Extended Producer Responsibility. It's a bill that would reduce packaging for paper and plastic waste. Uh, it was in a three-way negotiation between the governor, the Senate, and the Assembly. That's how far we got it. And in the last four days, it got dropped. So, you know, there are so many things we can do to reduce waste and then also to recycle better for the waste we do generate, and we're not doing it. It's not rocket science, but we can actually do it. So I agree with you, but I don't want to go into specifics because we're... Plastic is made from petroleum. So yes, and, and we're, getting, we're getting the tap so on the wrist. The it is getting a little bit late. Was there maybe one or two Quick, a question. Part? Yeah, so sure, it's the green inside, and out, sorry. <laughs> green inside and Out podcast, which I'm thinking about changing to just be the Sustainable Living podcast. So stay tuned. I've listened to it, and it's excellent. There you go. You got quite an endorsement there. All right. And, and Professor, did you um, choose the, uh, the shirt with the dinosaurs as a statement oh. about what's happening to civilization if we don't act on climate change, that we're going to go the way the dinosaurs? So we have some materials in the back. We can huddle and, and chat if you have additional questions. I thought this was a great program. What, what a great turnout. And really awesome dynamic back and forth. Great to thank our panel. Great to all panelists. Thank you for the organizers. And thank you, everybody. Great job.